it's time for the Pacific. Let me first of all congratulate the Indonesian government through Her Excellency Retno Marsudi, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Your Excellency the Ambassador Tantoi Yaya for uh, the organization of this year's uh, Pacific, Pacific Exposition. Uh, given the remarkable achievement that the Pacific countries, of course, with involvement of New Zealand, Australia, and other countries, to help in curbing uh, the health problems, particularly the pandemic that has been held at a moderate level and be able to prevent the onslaught of the disease from outside uh, is one of the models that actually can be followed and also looked at uh, if um, countries around the world are willing to learn and also share the experience of other countries. So in this um, specific forum, uh, I would like to allude to the fact that all the speakers that have been presented here are people with experience and insights, people with uh, remarkable uh, achievements in their in their career and also understanding of knowledge of the public health sector and policies in their respective countries. So without further ado, I'd like to begin by in inviting Her Excellency Retno L.P. Marsudi, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, but allow me to read out um, Her Excellency's short biography uh, for our uh, knowledge. Mrs. Retno L.P. Marsudi was born in Samarang on the 27th of November, 1962. She was appointed on the 27th of October, 2014, and as the foreign minister and is the first female foreign minister of Indonesia. Minister Marsudi graduated in 1985 from Universitas Gajah Mada, Yogyakarta, and majored in international relations. She has also pursued several other studies, namely European Union law at the Haxi Hong School in Den Haag, and human rights study at the Oslo University, Minister Marsudi is married to Mr. Agus Marsudi, an architect, a graduate of Delft University and Gajah Mada University. Minister Marsudi joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1986. She has served in various posts as follows. Minister of Foreign Affairs from October 2014 until the present day, she was ambassador to the Republic of, Indone of, the Republic of Indonesia to the Kingdom of the Netherlands from 2012 and 2014. She was Director General for American and European Affairs from 2008 to 2012. Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the Kingdom of Norway and the Republic of Iceland from 2005 to 2008. She was Director for West Europe Affairs 2003 and 2005. She was also held the position of Director for Infra and interregional, intra and interregional inter cooperation for America and Europe from 2001 to 2003. And she has also served as the Indonesian Embassy in the Indone at the Indonesian Embassy in Canberra from 1990 to 1994 and in the Hague from 1997 to 2001. Without further ado, I would like to invite Madame L.P. Marsuri. Minister of Foreign Affairs in Indonesia to make her speech. Madam, you have the floor. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, one year and 10 months into this pandemic, we are finally starting to see light at the end of the tunnel. New weekly cases and death have been declining globally. Just a few days ago, the WHO announced that the number of weekly death was at the lowest point in a year. In the meantime, the biggest vaccination campaign in our history continues to make strides, thanks in large part of Kutukovax. Now, nearly 7 billion doses of vaccine have been administered around the world. These all renew our hope that the pandemic could be defeated and life soon could return to normal. However, we cannot afford to let our guards down now. These skin are still very much fragile, and things may reverse course at the slightest sign of containment. It is important that we consolidate and build on these skins by making the right choices. 
and the choices we make in the coming weeks and months will determine whether we would recover together and recover stronger from this pandemic. Allow me today to explain two things that we should be focusing on right now. First, amplify our voices and support for vaccine equity. This is our priority in the short run. We are currently fighting an uphill battle. Global vaccination gap continues to widen. 75% of the global dose were administered in high and upper middle income countries, as opposed to less than 1% in low income countries. 56 countries failed to meet the WHO target to vaccinate 10% of their population by the end of September. And 82 countries are at risk of missing the target to vaccinate 40% of their population by this year's end. Vaccine supply is hardly a big issue anymore as global vaccine production is now reaching 1.5 billion doses monthly. The challenge now is what I like to refer as the two P's, politics and profits. Politics force countries to hoard doses for themselves, not allocating them fairly and discriminate others who opt for different vaccines. Profits tempt manufacturers not to prioritize contract with COVAX, but rather with wealthy countries. Vaccine is a life-saving instrument, and its equitable distribution is a humanitarian issue. Unfortunately, most of us does not have the capacity to produce large-scale COVID-19 vaccine, and rely on COVAX facility and dose sharing for their supply. Together, we must send larger messages for the international community to recommit to vaccine equity, strengthen their support to COVAX facility, and fulfill their dose sharing commitment immediately. Colleagues, now the second things that we should be focusing on is strengthening regional and global health resilience. This is more of a medium or longer term priority. This pandemic demonstrates how unprepared we are against emerging infectious diseases. Our task now is to learn from this pandemic and build stronger and more resilient health ecosystems. The WHO position paper to strengthen health resilience could be an important starting point for us. One thing for sure, we have to strengthen our regional capacity in the Pacific to meet our own medicine, vaccine, and medical equipment needs. This means our health industries must be able to scale up production. Support from other region and multilateral development banks would be critical, especially in terms of investment, technology transfer, and access to raw materials. Such partnership will also go a long way to support research and development of medicine and vaccine. It is especially critical for the Pacific countries to strengthen their health care system, make it affordable for the poor and most vulnerable, and ensure the number and capacity of medical workers match the threat of a pandemic. We have to engage with the WHO country and regional offices to devise our regional strategy against any future pandemic. And at the same time, we must lend our support to the upcoming negotiation on a new pandemic treaty. The treaty should reinforce cooperation to detect and prevent any future pandemics and ensure equitable access to medical solutions and technologies for developing countries. 
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let us work together to build a healthier Pacific region. And I believe this health forum is the right place for us to explore ideas on addressing this pandemic while taking into account the specific challenges faced by Pacific countries. I thank you and I wish you all a fruitful discussion. It's very good to listen to your uh, remarks. Uh, I think uh, without um, further ado, let me move on to, move on to the second speaker. Uh, I would like to introduce Honorable Valasi Luapito Fanua to Omega Tafito Selesele, uh, Minister of Health of Samoa. Uh, Mr. Valasi Luapito Fanua Selesele is a Samoan politician and cabinet minister. Mr. Tafito was elected to the Fono as a candidate for the Samoan Democratic United Party in the 1996 Samoan general election. He was re-elected in 2001. In 2005, he was appointed party secretary. In August 2020, Mr. Tafito was unanimously elected leader of the Samoan National Democratic Party, SNDP. Shortly afterwards, the SNDP agreed an electoral alliance with the FAST, FAST party, which would see them run a single joint candidate in each electorate for the April 2021 election, Samoan election. And in October 2020, he was nominated as the candidate for first preliminary results showed him winning his seat. On the 24th of May 2001, he was appointed Minister of Health in the elected cabinet of Fiamme Naomi Mataafa. In August 2021, Mr. Vatas announced that the government was considering establishing an inquiry into the 2019 Samoan business outbreak. Without further ado, I would like to introduce His Excellency, Honorable Valasi Luapif Tofanua, to Omega Tafito Selesele, Minister of Health of Samoa. The floor is yours, sir. Honorable Minister Red Nomushuti, your Excellency Tantrowi Yaha Dwa, distinguished panel members, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the government of Indonesia and the organizing committee for the opportunity to speak at this prestigious forum with the focus on strengthening health infrastructure in the Pacific. As you are aware, the pandemic has compelled us to reassess every situation strategically, review our priorities, as well as reallocate the limited resources available to us. The government of Samoa declared a national state of emergency and immediately closed its border in March 2020. The health, safety, and security of our people took precedence over economic considerations. We knew from our experiences of the 2019 measles epidemic that we needed supplies, medical equipment, including testing facilities in country. The Samoa National Emergency Operations Committee, NEOC, chaired by the CEO of Ministry of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, and comprised of all key agencies are at the forefront of Samoa's COVID-19 response. The New York provides advice to government on all measures, including travel, travel advice, stock of health supplies, health staff and facilities, quarantine international flights and public health awareness. Today, some state of emergency restrictions have been relaxed, including the resumption of inter-island maritime travel and public transportation with restriction on operating hours and passenger numbers. Restaurants and markets were allowed to open with limited hours and social distancing 
distancy rules and other emergency restrictions. With borders remaining closed, Samoa has adapted to living in a new normal amidst necessary public health measures to ensure the continued safety and security of our people. To help ease the economic impacts of COVID-19 at the national level, the government of Samoa unveiled two stimulus packages in the first half of 2020 to cushion the impacts of business and families from COVID-19. The first value at 23.6 million US dollars was adopted in April to support inter alia, the business sector and tourism related businesses in particular, which have laid off over 500 workers. In June 2020, the government announced a phase two package amounting to 29.88 million US dollars targeted at individuals and households most affected by the economic impacts of the pandemic. The budget also appropriate funds to further strengthen the health and education sectors and introduce new programs for social protection measures, particularly for vulnerable groups. To enable the government of Samoa to undertake testing in country, it sought assistance from its development partners and United Nations agency for procurement of equipment testing kits and reagent supplies. The availability of testing equipment enabled the Ministry of Health to facilitate repatriation flights for some more na nationals across the globe. To date, the National Emergency Operations Committee has successfully managed just over 40 international flights and have repatriated close to 7,000 passengers most of whom were returning citizens stranded abroad during the border closures. Unused tourism facilities have been used as quarantine facilities. Vaccination offered the best protection against COVID-19. Getting access to vaccines became an urgent priority for Samoa and the region given that priority of countries that remained COVID-free were all in the Pacific region. We are, grateful for, we are grateful for the tremendous help from the COVAX facility, as well as our partners in the region, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, and the UN system in particular, WHO and UNICEF, for supporting the facilitating early access to vaccines. AstraZeneca was used for the eligible population since April while Pfizer, which arrived on the 19th of October, is now used to vaccinate 12 to 17 year old since 25th October 2021. Following our mass vaccination campaign, we had achieved 95 percentage. That is 115,679 people. Coverage from four of first dose. 67.1 percentage, that is 81,000 806 fully vaccinated with AstraZeneca vaccine and 21.6 percentage, that is 6,034 coverage for the first dose of Pfizer. Potential for discussions around travel purpose will very much depend on how quickly we can achieve a 98 percentage full vaccination coverage. In preparation towards reopening of borders last month, the government launched the Samoa Travel Tracer app. The app, which is a joint initiative between the Ministry of Health and Samoa Tourism Authority, is a vital component of Samoa Travel Ready Toolkit, which includes vaccination, tourism business operator training and maintenance, and sales and marketing initiatives. The Samoa Travel Tracer was developed locally and uses Bluetooth to trace close contact between users. Data collected will be used solely by the Ministry of Health for contact tracing purposes. I will that there will, I believe that there will be rich knowledge sharing today and throughout the expo on experiences and lessons learned, especially on responses 
through the pandemic. I look forward to engaging in this exchange and how Samoa can also benefit from lesson learned. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, Honorable Mr. Valassi Luapi Fotonua, Tomega Tafito Selesele. It's been great listening to your um, speech on the experience of uh, uh, your country, uh, which is uh, very um, interesting. I, we understand that you're not going to be staying until the end of the, the session for questions and answers, and your Chief Executive Officer, uh, the Director General of Samoan Ministry of Health, Dr. Take Nasseri, will take over. For the question. So thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you. I now uh, move on to um, Professor Michael Becker, Department of Public Health of Otago University. Kia ora, Professor. Uh, yeah. Let me introduce uh, Professor uh, Baker um, briefly, uh, who is an epidemiologist with the University of Otago University and a member of the New Zealand Food Safety Authorities Academy and of the New Zealand Ministry of Health Pandemic Influence Technical Advisory Group, or PTAC. Professor Becker attended secondary school in Hamilton, medical school in Auckland, and the University of Otago. He served as a medical advisor for the Ministry of Health in that role he worked on the response to the HIV slash AIDS epidemic and helped set up a needle exchange program. He was appointed to the faculty of, at the University of Otago in 1997, and then rising to the rank of professor in the Department of Public Health at the University of Otago, Wellington, in 2013. He has campaigned heavily to reduce Campylobacter contamination in chicken in New Zealand. Professor, without further ado, uh, I'll lend the floor to you. Thank you very much. Yes, well, Tena Koto Katoa, Salama Si Yang, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Suarez, and thank you to the Indonesian government for hosting this important meeting. Uh, being an academic, of course, I can't resist having some PowerPoint slides. So I'm picking up very much on this important theme of strengthening health infrastructure in the Pacific. And uh, obviously, uh, there are huge lessons from battling the COVID-19 pandemic. So today I want to um, talk about seven key areas of infrastructure need that I think the pandemic has demonstrated very graphically. I think the, firstly, the, the need for evidence-informed strategy, this ability to work out the key goal for responding to a pandemic, and this has made a huge difference globally. Then obviously the ability to deliver key interventions in a coordinated way, this vital focus on equity that we've already heard about, the critical role of effective communication, having public health institutions and infrastructure that could support these functions, the, the critical need for improved global health institutions, and obviously the ability to adapt to future threats and opportunities. So um, one of the, I guess my biggest lesson from the pandemic is this, the critical importance of strategy and I think this winning combination of effective science and good political leadership. Uh, as, as they say, every disaster movie starts with the government ignoring a scientist. And I think fortunately, the government in New Zealand didn't ignore the scientists. So this is a complex slide, but it, what it's trying to say, this was our, um, a paper we published in the British Medical Journal at the end of last year, where we provided a typology of pandemic responses. And uh, one of the reasons I think the Asia-Pacific region and the Pacific in particular has fared so well during the pandemic was it had a very clear commitment to uh, elimination strategy or the more extreme version, the exclusion strategy, where you just don't have the virus in your country at all. And this gives you the opportunity to, to emerge into a virus-free new normal, and that has been very beneficial. Otherwise, you have a suppression approach or more the mitigation as we sometimes say, the let it rip approach, herd immunity, which has performed very poorly. So New Zealand embraced the elimination strategy very early on when we had no deaths and very few cases. And this really astounded people internationally that New Zealand would do this and also other countries in this region. 
So what is the, what's the benefits of um, uh, the elimination approach? Um, basically, for many Pacific nations, um, the, the mortality rate was zero. But for, for larger countries in the region uh, pursuing elimination, the mortality risk per million was very low, say in New Zealand, five per million. This is 400-fold less than the experience of countries in Europe. And had New Zealand, for example, had the mortality experience of the UK or US, we would have lost 0.2% of our population, about 10,000 people. So one of the other benefits of protecting public health is you also protect the health of the economy. And this is just showing economic performance in New Zealand uh, for last year and the first quarter of this year. The second quarter was very good. The third quarter will be not so, quite so good. But basically, uh, and all of us realize this, that actually protecting the health of people is very good for the economy also. So the um, critical question about strategy, of course, you have to change at a certain point. Elimination was the best, the optimal approach in the first year when all we had were public health and social measures. Now we have vaccines and we also have more infectious variants, obviously the Delta variant. So we've got this great choice between control, that's for endemic infections and suppression, or progressive elimination, potentially leading to eradication. Now this is not looking possible with, with current tools, but it certainly still, I think, has potential in the longer term as we apply it to measles and polio, we just need more effective vaccines and antivirals. So obviously delivery is important, and this is just showing the components of the elimination strategy. You obviously have to be able to manage borders, uh, to be able to do contact tracing uh, and testing, and then to dampen down transmission in the community with things like masks and travel restrictions um, and lockdowns, and increasingly use of vaccine and of course, we also need a social safety net to support um, uh, vulnerable groups. So all of this requires a great deal of capacity for delivery. I mean, we can look at you know, applying new science about understanding the role of ventilation and the, the critical role of masks, for instance, and interrupting transmission, far more effective than hand washing, for instance, with this particular pathogen. And similarly, the great revolution, the other great revolution in the first year, of course, the development of multiple safe and effective vaccines. So the question then, of course, is delivery. And we can see, we can look at um, uh, different trajectories countries have been on around the world in terms of vaccine coverage and the impact on um, morbidity or cases and mortality. And we can see at a population level, obviously, important benefits from achieving high vaccine coverage. But it, as, as usual, it's a complex story. So. Uh, a critical area is this focus on equity. This is looking at a century of influenza pandemics in New Zealand and the rate ratio of mortality for Māori compared with European and other. And we can see that across, even to recent times, there's a markedly higher risk of uh, mortality for a disease like influenza. And we would see the same pattern with um, COVID-19. Uh, although fortunately we've had very few deaths in New Zealand. We can see this pattern with hospitalizations, for instance. So one of the reasons for focusing on equity is it's actually critical if you're going to try and manage outbreaks that you can focus on equity. This is showing how in Auckland, the Delta variant outbreak was looking like it was going to be eliminated with an intense lockdown, but unfortunately we didn't deal with inequality. And so we had continuing transmission in marginalized populations. And in the end, that meant that the outbreak itself was not controllable. And that's forced New Zealand to have a rapid shift to a suppression approach in Auckland. We've already heard about um, the most um, obscene example of inequality globally, the failure to deliver vaccines to people in the most deprived countries on earth, particularly across Africa. And this is really, as has already been identified, the most visible form of inequity in the globe at the moment. Uh, effective communication, uh, so it's a complex graph, but this is showing um, trust in governments. And we know that, uh, that um, obtaining this social license to do really remarkable strategies like elimination depends on good communication. And this is just showing that New Zealand is above average in the OECD in terms of public trust in government. We also have the question of dealing with misinformation. And what I find very concerning is disinformation where 
it's misinformation that has a deliberate and misleading component, which is really around propaganda. And I think this is something that we are all engaged in trying to, to manage. And in the most extreme cases, there are many examples of how misinformation and disinformation kills. This is an example of a Norwegian conspiracy theorist who said COVID-19 was a hoax and he died from the virus after hosting illegal health, house parties. I and mean, that was an unusually graphic example, but we know that uh, every day we see examples of how uh, misinformation can kill and hurt people. So effective public health infrastructure. I, I love the saying, a public health triumph, nothing happened. And this is one of the real problems of investing in prevention is it's not visible. So we have to keep reminding ourselves that prevention is better than cure. This is just showing how uh, during the COVID-19 response in New Zealand, we assembled for, for, for the first time a proper national public health agency by pulling all these functions together nationally and locally and across multiple agencies and bringing in scientific expertise. So it can be done in a crisis situation. We need to maintain this momentum uh, when we're not confronted by a huge existential threat. Sometimes we also need physical facilities like um, quarantine facilities would be one example. So global health institutions, I think we're all aware of the failings of the World Health Organization. It doesn't have the resources and mandate to provide the level of leadership we expect. I, I think um, I, I like the report that Helen Clark produced with the independent review panel. Uh, I think it's an aspirational title, make COVID the last pandemic. And I think there are a lot of things here that we need to work on. Uh, we, need, we obviously need to look at the origins of this virus. It almost certainly came at, from spillover infection in an animal reservoir. I think laboratory leaks are very unlikely, but we do need to keep ensure high standards of laboratory containment. And this is just reminding us this ability to manage future threats and opportunities. We've got many other examples of threats here that we have to deal with. And unfortunately, novel synthetic diseases are one of them. We, also, we obviously have these other threats we need to deal with, um, uh, sustainability, climate change, and equity. And I think there are many opportunities that have emerged during um, the pandemic uh, in terms of learning to do things differently in lots of areas. So just to summarize, uh, I've really talked about um, seven areas where I think the pandemic has demonstrated the need for infrastructure improvements in this region. And I hope that I can work with um, other members of this panel and other people watching to help um, transform the um, infrastructure environment in our region. I think we have great opportunities to do that. Thank you all. And I just want to acknowledge my many collaborators and, and, and uh, uh, colleagues at the University of Otago Wellington. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Baker, um, with uh, the key strategies that actually um, have introduced. I think, um, you know, they value a lot. Uh, and of course, most of the countries have also tried to fill in in some of these strategies, and New Zealand is one of the examples. Um, so congratulations. Uh, I'd like to move on uh, to uh, Mr. Colin and David Beck. Uh, the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Solomon Islands. Um, let me uh, introduce Mr. Beck, who is a career diplomat and served in various Solomon Islands missions around the world. He was first posted as counselor to the Solomon Islands Embassy to the European Union, Belgium, Germany, Netherlands, and the UK. He was uh, then served as a non-resident ambassador to Cuba, non-resident High Commissioner to Canada, non-resident ambassador to the US, permanent representative to the United Nations in New York and High Commissioner to Australia. From 2018, Mr. Colin David Beck was appointed permanent secretary of the INFAT, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Solomon Islands. Mr. Beck also has extensive academic background, namely from University of South Pacific, University of Oxford, the UK, and a master's degree from University of Queensland, Australia. Let me give the floor now to Mr. Colin David Beck for his presentation. Please do, sir. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, uh, Facilitator, um, Honorable uh, Donisio uh, Soares. Um, thank you very much also for, for your um, uh, introduction. Let me begin by um, uh, just uh, conveying uh, Solomon Islands' uh, um, uh, deepest condolence to all countries who have basically lost uh, loved ones during the during the um, impact uh, of the um, uh, COVID-19. And we certainly, I think COVID-19 um, have really uh, created havoc and um, unprecedented uh, economic and social impact on, uh, on, on, on our lives, basically turning our lives upside down. Um, um, but I think it has also uh, brought us closer together. Um, of course, we do have challenges in terms of uh, dealing with it, but. Uh, um, but I think um, strength and uh, relationship have been developed and uh, uh, certainly I think um, with this platform, um, learning from each other and uh, um, trying to um, uh, uh, keep building on uh, where we are in terms of going forward, I think um, uh, this provides an, an excellent uh, opportunity. Um, just before I, I start to, to talk about uh, Solomon Islands uh, uh, experience in dealing with this, I just want to quickly uh, acknowledge uh, her Excellency uh, Retno Masudi, uh, the Foreign Minister of uh, Indonesia, really, and not only for a uh, message in terms of uh, talking about the vaccine, um, what we need to do, as well as the, the, the some of suggesting the pandemic uh, treaty. That's uh, something I think um, the world basically needs, uh, especially for small island countries. You know, we really depend on multilateralism. Uh, in terms of uh, moving, uh, uh, in terms of uh, dealing with some of these global um, global issues, I just want to also thank, um, uh, acknowledge as well, um, um, uh, Indonesia for their leadership in terms of bringing the uh, Pacific family together, um, beginning in uh, to 2019. In terms of creating that uh, Pacific momentum, it's strong enough that uh, two years later, it's Pacific time. It's time for the Pacific. Uh, so the two theme basically connects our people, our, our, our countries in terms, of, uh, um, in terms of where we are now. But uh, we certainly uh, would like to thank uh, Indonesia for the courage, strength, especially at a time when everyone's hurting, but at the right time when we basically need each other, um, uh, you know, going forward. So um, we just want to, to, to register that. Well, for Solomon Islands, uh, uh, co-facilitator uh, facilitator and um, uh, honorable ministers and all uh, other uh, uh, panelists and listeners, um, Solomon Islands, uh, have basically, I think our story is similar to, to what uh, honorable uh, minister of Samoa have uh, um, uh, alluded to. Um, we have basically used science to guide and shape our policies, uh, uh, the forms of our protocols and the direction of our uh, regulation in terms of uh, in terms of uh, combating uh, COVID-19. But strongly, uh, we have uh, more or less um, uh, uh, guided by the um, uh, global um, 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 uh, advice uh, from the World Health Organization as well. Um, we, we certainly, um, our journey, more or less, if, uh, when we look at it, it more or less mirrors um, what uh, WHO has basically done when it declared uh, COVID-19 uh, back in uh, January as a health emergency, 31st of January. Um, for many of us, we started issuing travel advice as early as that within the first quarter um, from February. Um, well, for, for Solomon Islands, we started restricting travel to uh, issuing uh, travel advice, restricting travel to China. We have uh, uh, more or less... Um, issued travel advices, um, you know, for infected countries um, uh, um, they would require, uh, for infected, uh, infected countries, you know, couldn't uh, enter the country. It allowed, if we more or less um, on um, 911 uh, state of uh, emergency in the sense of trying to, to build our, our national capacity to try to um, receive uh, all our uh, uh, um, uh, both nationals living uh, all, all around the world, as well as uh, um, um, uh, people who wish to return to the passengers who wish to return to the Solomons, uh, we need to, to, to more or less look at our uh, domestic uh, health system and uh, um, more or less uh, prepare for them. Um, the world, when the World Health uh, Organization declared a global pandemic on the 12th of March, Solomon Islands, uh, like other Pacific countries, 
um, we declared a state of emergency on the 25th of March. So for us, the flight started to be restricted, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, government and um, officials were not allowed to travel. We started to, to take uh, various measures in terms of uh, uh, dealing with this. Um, in terms of governance, we, we have a uh, oversight committee made up of the uh, um, Secretary of the Prime Minister, um, who chairs the committee, which is basically made up of all um, um, permanent secretaries or secretaries of all uh, government uh, um, ministries in which we, we more or less uh, try to look at uh, the various, uh, look at uh, uh, keeping the uh, virus out of our borders. And secondly, to try to also uh, have measures in place in terms of uh, raiding uh, uh, frontliners to stop and contain the virus once it enters our borders, as much as at all costs to prevent community transmission. And uh, thirdly, basically the recovery uh, element of our plan in terms of uh, trying to recover from the, the, the pandemic. So we had a uh, preparedness response plan drawn up um, that, um, that, uh, that, that, that more or less guided our, our approach in terms of going forward. But what actually, um, but we did not have the equipment, the tools, the testing, uh, the, the testing uh, equipment, um, um, and also the medical supplies that needed to to uh, to uh, facilitate many of our uh, many, uh, to facilitate um, um, you know um, for us to uh, uh, start bringing in our, our 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 nationals from abroad who were waiting, who were stranded. Um, um, we couldn't bring them until um, we had to support them while, while, for some, we had to support them while, while they were uh, stranded. Um, and it was really an expensive uh, exercise, but uh, um, this is why I said the world has become smaller uh, with uh, this global uh, uh, pandemic in the sense of uh, we, everyone came together. We had to call, uh, we had to call, reach out to various uh, partners, uh, um, that uh, provided uh, testing equipment. China uh, provided us te testing equipment. Uh, Australia responded uh, with the vaccine. Basically, uh, nearly all our friends uh, responded. Um, 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 we had a response also from uh, Australia, New Zealand, China, Japan, um, Indonesia um, also offered um, uh, to support us. And we were looking at uh, building an infrastructure within the our city where there is no other clinic uh, in that particular location. And uh, we, 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 we are working with uh, the Indonesian government on, on that. Um, just uh, um, one of the most important thing is that uh, we did was uh, um, setting up government quarantine station. And, and I think, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, trying to look at all the mechanisms that will deal with that. Um, because we had some really stringent uh, mechanisms, uh, stringent in the sense of uh, um, before passengers coming in, we had, uh, they had for high risk countries, we, they had to have uh, three uh, uh, tests, uh, COVID tests, to three negative tests to enter the country while coming back into the country, another 21 days with three uh, negative tests before they are released. But if anyone actually is positive, um, what we usually do is um, what, what we normally do is uh, um, they have they have to have three negative tests within a 21 day period before they can be um, uh, released to the community. It's just that we have we had uh, two lockdowns, simulated lockdowns, just to test our system, um, um, just to test our system, and we found that we couldn't afford. Um, once the pandemic uh, uh, entered the country, we couldn't afford to uh, economically to to close down the economy. Um, and and that, but I think my uh, time is really uh, coming close. But let me just speak slightly on the economic uh, aspect in terms of um, responding to that, because I think we we are we we we, we were hit uh, economically as well. Um, so what we did was like some more. We had to stimulate. Uh, uh, stimulus uh, economic package that, that focused on the productive sector. We directed our political, uh, political uh, 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 policies and directed only on the productive sector. But I just want to, to, to finally um, um, uh, close by saying this. Um, um, 
economically, while we do all this stimulus, we focus more on also our national projects, starting our airports, building our roads, building wharfs, um, building um, uh, our uh, national stadiums, and so forth. Um, so that more or less is part of that. The second one is uh, labor mobility. We more or less uh, kept sending workers out uh, uh, because um, everyone was uh, economically hurt. And but uh, that uh, so labor markets in um, uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand, uh, we, we more, more or less contributed to, to our recovery. Just on finally, let me just say that uh, uh, right now we are looking at health legislation uh, to deal with pandemic, uh, uh, similar to, to deal with such pandemic as uh, what we are confronting on. Um, and we also, uh, one of the things that I want to say that uh, with the, as an island country, one of the real issue that we're having and why we cannot afford this is because much of our population have, uh, uh, have this non-communicable disease. So once they, they're basically vulnerable once it uh, enters into our into our economy. Secondly, um, even during the crisis, we still had to deal with climate change. Um, we had a hurricane uh, that uh, that uh, impacted our uh, our country, and we've lost lives. We, in fact, we have lost more lives uh, from climate change than uh, we have uh, than than from uh, than than from um, than from uh, uh, COVID. So I just want to close by really saying that uh, communication, as uh, um, an earlier speaker uh, alluded to, is important. We have uh, uh, regular statements by the Prime Minister, talkback shows on a weekly basis by, um, by uh, the government, as well as uh, messages from the uh, Ministry of Health. I just, uh, on vaccination, that's something that we, we for us, we need to have 90% before we start opening our borders. So I just thought, uh, and, uh, Raise that, but uh, I think um, if the world come together as we have come together with uh, in dealing with COVID, we hope that this same attention uh, we can give to climate change. This same attention we can give to biodiversity crisis. We can give to plastic pollution that is also impacting the region. And I, I just want to 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 register that that really I think we need to do that. Other, other than that, uh, facilitator, I, I pass the floor back to you, and I do apologize for uh, spilling over my time. Thank you. Thank you uh, for such an enriching experience from uh, your country, uh, and also the efforts that they're trying to do to uh, maximize your efforts to combat the pandemic, mindful of the shortcomings and also the issues that actually you're facing internally. So it is uh, an issue for all Pacific countries, and I think uh, we all are working hard to address this issue in particular. Um, let me move uh, to uh, the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Paula Divili, the Deputy Director General of Science and Capability, the Pacific Community. Uh, Dr. Paula Divili is the Deputy Director General of Science and Capability. He was the Director of Public Health Division of, at the Pacific Community and has held his position for six years, from 2013 to 2020. His experience will assist Dr. Vivili. His experience uh, assists Dr. Vivili in his new role as it provides him with an intimate knowledge of the Pacific community, its people, and uh, partners. Dr. Vivili holds undergraduate degrees in human nutrition from Otago University in New Zealand and, and medicine from University of uh, the South Pacific, as well as a master's degree in international public health from the University of Sydney. In addition, he has also undertaken a World Health Organization Fellowship at the University of Auckland and Auckland Hospital in ophthalmology. So without further ado, um, I'll pass on the floor to Dr. Vivili. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, honorable ministers, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation and I'm happy uh, to be here today to share quite a short overview of the COVID-19 uh, response in the Pacific. Uh, if anything, I have uh, three key messages on the response that has been happening. One is that there has been extremely strong leadership from the countries themselves in what happens in their own countries. Second, as a result of the response, Pacific Island countries and territories are at a better place, in fact, at the best place they've ever been. 
to respond to a pandemic. Of course, this is not saying that they are ready uh, to respond in, a, in the best way possible, but they are certainly in a better way than when this all started. And thirdly, there's been unprecedented levels of collaboration between the countries, development partners, and implementing agencies. If we look at the current status of uh, COVID-19 in the region, uh, as has been alluded to earlier, uh, the approach from, from Pacific Island countries and, and territories has mostly been to restrict uh, entrance of COVID-19 to the region. And as you can see, uh, those that had very strict uh, policies uh, ended up not having too many cases. Uh, and some, uh, because of other reasons, uh, opened up their, their borders uh, somewhat earlier. Uh, and you can see that these countries had uh, more cases compared to others. So as a result, out of our 22 Pacific Island countries and territories, uh, nine of them are still COVID free as of yesterday. Uh, and 13 uh, countries have, have had uh, COVID-19 cases. In terms of, of numbers of cases uh, as shown by this uh, a graph here, it ranges from, from for example, Samoa having at uh, one case and a few countries having less than 10 cases uh, to the five countries that have had majority of the cases in the region, namely Fiji, French Polynesia, Papua New Guinea, Guam, and uh, New Caledonia. If we look at the number of cases, we can see uh, the, the phases that we've gone through in the different countries that have had uh, uh, cases that have increased in, in numbers. So from this graph here, for example, you can see Fiji having the, their cases go up and they're going down and now New Caledonia is uh, having quite a number of cases uh, coming through. As I mentioned, uh, uh, the partners really came together. Uh, and WHO led the joint incident management team. And as a result, more than 20 uh, implementing agencies came together to, to form the joint incident management team to try and coordinate uh, the, the response to COVID-19 to be able to support the countries better. This was one of the uh, good things that happened. And as a result of the work of the joint incident management team, uh, the uh, humanitarian, Pacific Humanitarian Pathway was also uh, agreed to by the leaders, uh, which helped in uh, controlling a lot of the things that would have been blockages in the approach to, to COVID-19 with the countries during the pandemic. I mean, it's a crowded slide, but just to show that uh, on, all, on all the different areas of the response, there were different uh, organizations leading and with the support uh, that everybody brought to the table, the support for the countries was able to be uh, a, a lot more uh, uh, coordinated and the countries were supported better. Just uh, uh, one slide on, on the success story of, of the response to COVID and this was on uh, lab testing. Uh, the preferred way for testing for uh, COVID-19 is RT-PCR and when the uh, pandemic started, only five countries were able to test for uh, COVID-19 using RT-PCR. And, and this was French Polynesia, Fiji, Guam, New Caledonia, and Papua New Guinea. However, uh, since COVID-19 uh, came through, nine additional countries have been able to uh, put in place RT-PCR testing capacity uh, as per the list there. And currently, uh, another uh, four countries are also in, in the process of uh, putting into place uh, RT-PCR testing capacity. In fact, all the Pacific Island countries and territories are able to test for COVID, but the ones that are using this uh, preferred technology for testing are as on the slide here. So this was possible with funding support from the countries that are named there, Australia, China, Korea, New Zealand, Taiwan, uh, and USA. Uh, with technical support from a number of agencies to make this happen. One of the things that is a benefit of, of this technology is that it is also allowing the countries to test for other diseases that they would normally not have been able to test for. So, for example, in some of these countries, uh, they are seeing some dengue fever cases. 
before COVID-19 and before being able to use this technology to test for COVID. Countries would have had to send their samples away to New Zealand or Australia uh, to get testing for dengue fever. But the fact that we have this now, uh, all the countries that have COVID-19 testing capacity with this technology will be able to test for all these other diseases as well. So uh, it's a good example of all the partners coming together to increase the capacity of the health system to be able to test for COVID. And in so doing, it is able to uh, test for other things as well that uh, us usually they would not have been able to. In terms of vaccination, we've, we've heard a lot uh, uh, of discussions on, on vaccination and uh, perhaps it is important to note that without the support of uh, friends of the Pacific, the Pacific might have been in the same position as some of the other developing countries in struggling to get uh, uh, vaccination uh, vaccines into the countries. And so there's been very strong support from Australia, China, France, India, Japan, uh, New Zealand, Taiwan, and USA. And of course, for many countries, the COVAX facility was a significant part of the work that has been happening in getting vaccines uh, to the countries. Uh, the vaccines that are being used are AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Moderna, and, and Pfizer uh, for the French aligned uh, territories, as well as the US affiliated states. Uh, they have been mostly using Pfizer and Moderna. And, and for the others, uh, it has been mostly AstraZeneca. Very crowded slide again, but just to show that all the 22 Pacific Island countries and territories have access to vaccines so far. Uh, in terms of how much has been covered, uh, eligible population being covered, it, it ranges from 10% uh, to almost 100%, uh, depending on, on which country you, you look into. But uh, Basically, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, all Pacific Island countries and territories have been fortunate uh, with the support that they have. It should be said that the uh, uh, vaccine hesitancy has been stronger in some countries compared to others. Uh, it's also worth saying that the approach of uh, uh, countries has been a little bit different in terms of uh, in, in some countries, for example, here in Fiji, it's um, no jab, no job. So the, the government is mandating that everybody that is uh, employed uh, needs to be uh, vaccinated and has made changes to the Occupational Health and Safety Act to, to enable this. In some of the other countries, uh, the stance has been to, to make it voluntary and uh, probably reflects on the higher number of uh, vaccination coverage is aligned to the countries that have a more stringent requirement for vaccination. And for the countries that don't have such a uh, a strong requirement plus a strong vaccine hesitancy, their vaccine rate has been uh, a little bit lower. One of the things that has, is being discussed at the moment is uh, vaccine uh, certificates. And uh, leading on from the leaders' uh, communique in, in August of this year, the partners are working together to establish a, a practical process into making vaccine certification possible because uh, as borders begin to open, this is going to become an important part of the, of the process. So at the recent Heads of Health, of, uh, Heads of Health meeting, for instance, the uh, Heads of Health endorsed the, the roadmap into putting this together. Of course, some of the countries uh, are putting in place their own processes and their own systems uh, into having a vaccine certificate. But as a region, uh, the countries are looking into making it possible to have a regional vaccine certificate uh, that is robust enough and accepted by all the teams. And I'll end it there, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. And hopefully when the borders open up, we uh, have time to do uh, other things. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vivili, um, for such a very elaborative um, uh, explanation of uh, uh, the statistics and also the efforts that have been made um, in that region. And it's so good to um, get to know and also uh, understand uh, the specifics of what um, have been done to cater or curb this uh, pandemic uh, in the region. So, um, I would like to actually, before um, moving to the next uh, uh, speaker, uh, to reach out to uh, 
our audience, if, if you are willing to uh, present uh, questions or make comments, please uh, link yourself up with the uh, link that has been, uh, or address that has been provided uh, and make, make sure um, you make, uh, write, it, write it short because we will have around 25 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions. And please do write um, in the screen or uh, in, the, in the link that's been provided and this will be read out by each of the speakers. Uh, the next speaker will be Mr. Bruce Armstrong, uh, the CEO of Aspen Medical Australia. Uh, Mr. Bruce is graduated from OT Officer Cadet School in uh, 1980. He was posted um, uh, to the Royal Australian Ar Artillery as a section commander in 8-12 medium regiment and his last assignment in military was a chief of staff of international forces East Timor prior to the United Nations handover in 2000. So he's a military uh, veteran from uh, in East Timor as well. After resigning from the Defense Force uh, in later 2000, Mr. Bruce's commercial role ranged from a global enterprise software company to a publicly listed automotive industry. Mr. Bruce joined Aspen Medical in April 2013 as Chief of Staff and was appointed CEO in 2015. <laughs> Aspen Medical, Aspen Medical global operation spanning in 16 countries with more than 6,000 employees. Currently, Bruce is a director on 12 national and international boards, including Aspen Medical and Lifeline ACT. So um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Bruce, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Ministers, Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, distinguished members of the panel, and to all of my friends and uh, the friends that we have across the Pacific and the, and the region, and in particular in, in, in Indonesia, uh, thank you very much for the great honour to be able to speak on this important topic of health in our region. Uh, next slide, please. So today I just wanted to briefly uh, talk to uh, you about us to start with our experience in COVID. Uh, look at some Pacific and international private sector project examples. And all of this I want to do because I really want to lead up to just some, dis uh, to hopefully prompt some discussion about use of the private sector in health. Next slide, please. So we were founded in 2003. Uh, we are a proud Australian company, but we would uh, almost in every case, we partner with other companies in the regions that we work in. We're a diversified health service provider. What does that mean? It means we provide everything from primary health care, tertiary health care, uh, so clinics, hospitals, ambulance services, aeromedical evacuation, uh, and uh, we manufacture PPE and we do that uh, around the world. We do specialise in remote, challenging and under-resourced environments, but not only. And, and our clients are, are governments, uh, they're the uh, major uh, non-government organisations and they're corporations all around the world. Next slide, please. The important thing to understand about us medical uh, and this flows right from our shareholders all the way through the board to the rest of the organisation, is we are committed to social purpose. And, we're, and we demonstrate that by signing up to the UN Compact, but also being certified as a benefit corporation. And I'd encourage everyone out there to do some research on what this, uh, this certification means. And it really is about companies trying to be the best they can for the world and in all the communities they work in. Next slide, please. So a bit about our experience. Next slide, please. Uh, worth noting, I'd ask everyone note that ASP Medical is the only or, uh, private organisation in the world that's certified by the World Health Organisation as an emergency medical team. And we received this certification in two areas for outbreaks and infectious diseases and also for tra trauma and surgical facility capability. We're very proud of that. And it's meant that we um, have uh, uh, completed a lot of work, especially uh, around COVID, 
uh, for uh, our own government, but governments and corporations globally. Next slide, please. Um, I won't list all those, but we have uh, done a lot of work both here um, and, uh, as I said, internationally uh, for many other governments and corporations uh, in COVID-19 projects. Next slide, please. So we try to put this, what we call the jigsaw puzzle together of all the different services that we could provide, um, including we've, we've uh, built a hospital right at our, at our hometown of Canberra uh, for the uh, ACT government, but also it starts with advisory services and, uh, and training and, uh, and those other services uh, that we can provide around COVID-19. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give you some examples, and these are really uh, 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 service examples uh, for the discussion that I'll go into later on about the utility of the uh, private sector in working with uh, the governments. Next slide, please. Asper Medical really started uh, in our own region, Regional Assistance Mission Solomon Islands. And as you can see, we're there for 13 years after three competitive tenders of supporting uh, firstly the Australian Defence Force and then the Australian Federal Police um, in providing that service in the Solomon Islands. And, and we have a very deep and uh, uh, relationship uh, with the Solomon Islands um, uh, to the point where many many of our team are actually uh, married to people from the Solomon Islands and, and our connection remains very strong. Next slide, please. Uh, we're very proud that we were selected after a competitive tender run by IFC, the World Bank, uh, to run a public-private partnership. We are partnered with the Fiji National Provident Fund, uh, who we've formed a special purpose vehicle to uh, design, build and operate uh, uh, the Latoka Hospital, uh, Fiji's second largest hospital of 305 beds and also take over the Bar Subdivisional Hospital of 70 beds and uh, we're hoping to increase that to 100. Uh, and that's a dependent population of 380. Now, this will undoubtedly, the aim is to improve the health system, the entire health system in Western uh, province, but it's not only about improving the health system. This project is about jobs. It's about stimulating the economy uh, as well in, in making it easier for tourists to come back uh, uh, to Fiji. Next slide, please. Uh, one not in the near region, but I thought worthy of mention is we're also doing a public-private partnership in, uh, in the UAE for the Abu Dhabi Department of Health. Um, we're just about to open the first of the, our super clinics that looks very much what uh, you're looking at uh, here. And uh, we were able to get support from the Government of Australia to help us with the debt uh, funding for that particular project. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another one we're really proud of and, and it's in the early stages. And this is uh, in Indonesia. Next slide, please. So we've, we've partnered with uh, Asp Medical on the left, and you can see Doctor is a, 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 a company who has been in Indonesia for some time already. And PT Justice Sarana, uh, who is a state-owned infrastructure company in West Java. Next slide, please. Um, there is a shortage of beds in West Java, and it is as simple as that. And, uh, and uh, by the... Um, the bed ratios uh, recommended by the World Health Organization. And our goal is to, is to work with our partners and the government of West Java to fill that gap of those a shortage of, um, of uh, beds. Next slide, please. In its entirety, the scope of this is to, uh, is in the fullness of time, to, uh, complete 23 hospitals and up to 650 clinics but we've broken that down to phase one alpha, where we'll be looking to do two uh, international standard hospitals. Um, the uh, first stage of the banking feasibility study is complete and, uh, and we are making great progress in that particular project. Next, next slide, please. Just like Fiji, this is not only about 
uh, improving the health system in West Java. This is about the economy. This is about jobs uh, for the people of West Java and capacity building to improve uh, through training to improve the standards of, uh, of healthcare in that province. Next slide, please. And finally, um, one also that we're proud of that we've done work for the UN and UNFPA in this case, and uh, we were able to deliver three trauma hospitals under terrible, terrible circumstances in a conflict zone. Um, I love that photo because that was a uh, uh, that was that was a baby that was uh, saved by um, uh, staff brought to us, and uh, we're, uh, that baby was in a terrible condition when it came to us. And the other great um, uh, point on that slide is that there were 3,000 or just close to 3,000 babies delivered by us through our maternity hospitals on behalf of the UN, UNFPA. Next slide, please. So, private sector utilisation. Next slide, please. I think I've shown that there are many documented examples of how the private sector can support the government uh, to, uh, to either improve uh, the uh, system or assist in disaster and conflict. And I think governments are increasingly uh, recognising this, uh, the, uh, the potential for private sector. Next slide, please. I like this, it's a bit dated, but it came from the Australian government, and, and, uh, but it's still relevant today that they recognise that working to, together with private sector, we can leverage each other's assets, connect, connections, creativity and expertise. And that's for the advantage of the people of the countries that we work in and also the region. Next slide, please. There are a number of examples of state, stakeholder collaboration that I, I, I built there. Um, and I, I've talked about one here that was in West Africa when we, were, when we were working on the Ebola contracts uh, for the US government, the Australian government, the New Zealand government and the UK government. Next slide, please. And in summary, why private industry? Well, we have a regional presence. We're actually in 16 countries around the work, world today. We can bring sustain, sustainability to the projects. We can bring, I would argue, efficiency and lower costs and the innovation that we strive for every day, and we can also deliver capacity building. Next slide, please. I thank you very much for your time, and once again, the honour of being able to present um, uh, our uh, background and also pose that question about the utility of private industry. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, such a very um, good um, brief but uh, extensive uh, explanation of uh, uh, what you are doing um, as a part of the private sector and uh, working together with uh, governments in the region, particularly to help um, provide uh, the health infrastructure and also medical advisory as well as other uh, important uh, elements needed uh, for the health sector, including combating the pandemic and so on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as we come to uh, the end of the speeches, uh, we'll now move on to the uh, question and answer section. Uh, if you all have access to uh, the information, uh, there are around five uh, questions, or four questions, five questions with um, one comment, which I'll read out um, for all the speakers to um, share the answer. Uh, with the exception of those uh, whose actually names um, are mentioned and uh, may be addressed directly by uh, the speakers themselves. Uh, first of all, uh, there's a comment by an anonymous um, uh, that uh, he think, which he thinks uh, responded to uh, the Minister uh, L.P. Marsudi's uh, suggestion that uh, a treaty to ensure a reputable uh, distribution of, uh, equitable distribution of vaccines um, sounds great and um, how do countries um, would expect to roll it forward? Uh, so this is a question, a comment, but also questions for us to answer. Then the second uh, question will be, does the Pacific Island Forum Regional Vaccine Certificate Scheme recognize multiple vaccines? And I suppose for the 
for Mr. Vivili to uh, look at it. And also, um, the next question would be, uh, the next question is, how do you measure the effective health infrastructure? Uh, in case of um, small Pacific, in the case of small Pacific Islands, what is the key to have an effective health infrastructure? Uh, the next question for Professor Baker and Dr. Vivili. Do you think that the model of border reopening plan that recently introduced in New Zealand will work out in other Pacific countries? And then um, another question, another follow up question. So what will be the future challenge for the healthcare infrastructure and human resources to meet public health demand in post COVID? This is rather a general question, but I think with specific address to the Pacific Island countries. And also uh, the last question that I've got so far is to Samoa and Samoa, Solomon Islands. Um, do you think that uh, by reaching target of vaccination this year, your country will be ready to open the border again immediately? So these are the um, questions and some comments uh, which I think will be shared well uh, by your excellencies. And I would um, be happy to actually give the floor to you Please, you know, just intervene uh, uh, to answer these questions. Uh, mindful of the time because we have only about 25 minutes. So the questions or comments uh, make sure be as um, brief as possible. So uh, I'll probably start with um, uh, Dr. Baker. Now, could you repeat the question you were asking me to focus on? Well, um, the, there are um, a, a number of questions. Did you hear me clearly? Yeah. Could you hear me? There are a number of questions, uh, but I think the question that was addressed to you is that, and, and Dr. Vivili as well, Vivili, that do you think that the model of border reopening plan that recently introduced in New Zealand will work out in the other Pacific countries? Well, um, I can describe a little bit about what New Zealand's doing. And um, we've had a, uh, for some time a reconnection strategy, uh, but that's been brought forward by our Delta variant outbreak, which has really resulted in us having to accelerate that whole process. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, but the, the plan now is, um, and it was actually announced today, a refinement is to move to a, a reduced form of border quarantine from cutting down from 14 days to seven days, and then having the last three days um, in the person's home with um, obviously a range of um, testing, including some use of rapid antigen testing. So it's going to design to reduce the dependency on 14 days, which has been the real benchmark in, in a quarantine facility. But then it's going to become more um, uh, attenuated by degrees to other more to other additional stages early next year, and ultimately, uh, people who are fully vaccinated have a pre-departure test uh, from the country they're coming from, and also are coming from a low incidence country will be able to avoid uh, quarantine altogether. That's the end point. That's still some some way off, but the. Um, Prerequisite for that is that um, we will have transitioned to a suppression approach, away from elimination to suppression. We'll have a highly vaccinated population and we will be more tolerant of uh, circulating virus than we are now. So it's quite a different paradigm. It does shift the requirements. I mean, all of the arms of elimination will change as a result of that. But it's going to be um, a cautious approach because ultimately New Zealand is in the suppression model rather than the let it rip UK model of mitigation. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor. I'll move on to Dr. Vivili. Uh, the floor is yours. I think as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's been extremely strong leadership from the countries in what happens to them. Uh, and it would be fair to say that uh, whilst countries want to open up, uh, they do not want to open up knowing that they will not be able to cope with uh, COVID cases in the country. And, and despite uh, what I said earlier, in, in the countries being as prepared as they've ever been uh, to uh, cope with a pandemic, 
it is still very fair to say that uh, by and large, most countries will not be able to handle a COVID outbreak. And so this is why you're seeing a lot of the countries uh, setting a very high bar for vaccination rate uh, between 90 and some close to 100. Uh, and, and, and this, in a way, is telling us uh, what Michael has talked about often is understanding what the country wants as a target. And if your target is zero to close to zero cases, your approach will be uh, very stringent. And so in terms of New Zealand's approach, I think certain aspects of it will. Uh, Fiji here, for instance, at this point in time, they are planning to open up the borders uh, middle of next month. Uh, their vaccination rate for second doses for 18 plus is uh, getting on to 90%. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, their approach is as such. But by and large, most of the Arab Pacific Island countries are still uh, more stringent. And, and perhaps my colleague, uh, there also will uh, add on to some of the ideas. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for the explanation. Um, let me move on to um, the question that was addressed to Samoa and uh, Solomon Islands. Um, Your Excellencies, do you think uh, that by reaching a target of vaccination this year in your countries, uh, you know, your country will be ready to open the border again immediately, just to follow on what has been explained earlier? I'll go to Samoa first. Thank you, uh, Honorable Moderator. Well, with the numbers we are aiming for for the coverage, uh, we have created some confidence in opening and relaxing our borders, uh, but not, not without uh, some conditions, similar to what New Zealand is now practicing. We, we have a, uh, a free zone between American Samoa and Samoa, free quarantine. We've been practicing that for the past uh, six months. And knowing uh, we were worried uh, because they have flights straight from Hawaii to American Samoa. So we've given them some conditions that they have to be stay per to reside in American Samoa at least 28 days post quarantine period they offer. If they ever want to cross the border to Samoa, then they have to uh, make sure they stay in American Samoa for at least 28 days post quarantine. They stay quarantined for seven to 12, 14 days. And on top of that, they still have to do the pre departure and the antigen test and the medical clearance. So far, uh, they are, but now uh, citizens or residents go to American Samoa, they quarantine them for one day. Right. Uh, but they also require us to test them. And uh, so something similar along those lines. Uh, I think what New Zealand is doing is appropriate for New Zealand. They can afford this kind of system. But uh, over here is a small place and you can't tell someone to stay home for seven days, especially with a free atmosphere and a very hot climate at times. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'll move on to Dr. Uh, Colin. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Margarita. Um, just, just on um, the question of um, effective uh, health um, uh, um, system in the in, in the Pacific, I think that's basically an SDG question. Um, that's something that um, that um, we are working on in terms of trying to improve all our uh, all our uh, health system throughout the country. But just want to say that uh, with COVID, health has received global attention. And I think uh, uh, it is true through that, as uh, we have heard from the uh, uh, presentation by SPC, we have got the testing equipment. We have uh, uh, upgraded our, uh, our hospitals uh, to, you know, isolation unit, modernize it and, 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 and so forth. Uh, so we, it has more or less allowed the whole country to invest in our um, health system. And I think that that's something that I, I just wish to uh, state. But in terms of the vaccination, I think one of the challenges um, Solomon Islands continues to, 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 to face is uh, um, while we're moving in the right direction, but not fast enough. Um, 
the geography of the islands is just uh, uh, so uh, widespread. The logistics that needs to needs to roll it out, um, it's it's um, it's not as um, uh, um, uh, strong in the sense of uh, vaccinating. Um, um, trying to have teams to remain out in the um, rural areas and not to return back. Um, but uh, at the moment, because they don't have. Uh, um, equipment to stay and uh, remain um, uh, um, and keep moving from community to community um, has also somehow slowed the uh, slowed the um, uh, vaccination. Um, in terms of the timing as to whether we can meet the December, I don't think we will be able to. But uh, for Solomon Islands, we are neighbors to to Papua New Guinea, and the as as you know, the impact on Papua New Guinea is. Uh, is 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 uh, worrying for us. We share a common border that is basically a couple of meters, uh, cu cu sorry, a couple of uh, uh, kilometers away. And uh, so we have uh, for the traditional crossing. One of the things when we start saying closing borders, we basically close some of our traditional border crossing uh, areas. And then, but it's been porous. So we have invested in police. We have invested in uh, other aspects. So when we look at uh, COVID as a whole. We're basically talking about investing in all the different agencies uh, to, to really control things. So it's not just health, it's also our police, it's also our communities um, and so forth. So I, I thought I'd uh, just mention that. Oh, just on one final aspect is the for travel, we really need that uh, travel card. And at the moment, uh, we use, we're trying to use the WHO uh, travel uh, um, uh, card in, in terms of moving around, but there is a regional commitment in terms of having a common one in which uh, we will all will work with. Other than that, I, I pass the floor back to you, moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Such a, a very good explanation of uh, uh, what your country is doing in terms of infrastructure and also um, uh, other um, issues that are actually uh, dealing with the uh, infrastructure itself. Um, I think um, uh, there will be um, uh, more questions coming up, but let me just um, uh, throw this question that was, was addressed to Mr. Bruce, uh, um, you know, particularly given that your role as a private sector has been working together with the, the governments, uh, to, and how do you to consider to be the key factor to ensure, how do you consider to be the key factor to ensure sustainable development of health infrastructure beyond the pandemic? I mean, you, you, what are you doing now is great. Uh, but you know, um, what, what do you think um, you, you, you would be able to do beyond the pandemic itself uh, in the Pacific, Mr. Bruce? Yeah, look, look, a very good question because um, uh, I think we're all, all of us, uh, regardless of our role, are, are considering this question. Uh, but for me, uh, the great thing about health now is it has been um, elevated in the consideration by uh, all the uh, senior government uh, officials that I talk to across all the countries um, in the region. And, and so I think people see, now see the link with uh, health, security, um, and also economics, because we know that uh, by spending on health, uh, that, we, that can contribute to the stimulus um, as, as uh, all of our countries uh, uh, seek to come out of the, um, the impact, the uh, economic impact uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic has had. And so, uh, look, we're, we're standing by. Um, uh, everyone has their own unique needs, I would say. And, uh, and uh, far be it from, from myself or my team to try and tell people what their needs are. Uh, we would always propose to listen. And if we can contribute in, in any way uh, to support uh, each, of, each of the uh, countries as, as we look to come out of this uh, pandemic, uh, then we, we would uh, welcome any opportunity to do so. But, but I think the link between health, security and economics is, is, uh, is very welcome and pleasing to see. Thank you, Thank you very much, um, Mr. Armstrong. Um, uh, it's good to actually have you on board. Uh, I think you um, will be one of the key partners of the governments to really address this issue since it is uh, unprecedented uh, disease that has havoc around the world. I would um, uh, now actually um, share these questions among all of you. I think, um, you know, since you are working in the area in the Pacific uh, and also the aim is to achieve some of the 
uh, objectives that make sure that to make sure that the, the, the challenges that, that uh, we, we are facing in the Pacific um, are not um, an easy task, uh, given uh, the vast uh, continent that you share and also the communication and everything, uh, while it remains uh, an important issue for uh, uh, our uh, efforts to combat the pandemic and address the health issues. I mean, what, what do you think um, is, is the challenge that is really there for um, the healthcare infrastructure uh, and human resources to meet the public health demand uh, now and in, in the future? I mean, I, I'm aware of what, what uh, some of you has mentioned before, but I think what do you think still really needs to be addressed uh, to uh, make sure that you know, issues like this can be um, curbed or also um, or challenges that actually are now um, you are confronting can be also addressed uh, now and in the future. I'll probably go uh, with Mr. Uh, uh, Nasseri first. For this, <laughs> letting me answer this first. <coughs> What will be the future challenge for healthcare infrastructure? It depends. Uh, we have a uh, uh, local belief that pandemics come in every hundred plus years. So we are not anticipating another pandemic in three or five years. But the recovery plans we are working on now, I think we started these recovery plans during the preparedness and readiness phase. At that time of uncertainty when uh, there was no test available, but cases were spreading out very fast around the globe. And uh, there were very few travel restrictions from the big countries. So I think that was when we started looking at what's needed, which obviously the smaller Pacific Islands uh, we don't have that technology to match what the capacity of the developed countries. We have to go back and look at how to turn the peak wards into a low pressure ward. We have to look at again because we minimize our, our wards, our low pressure wards when the TB cases have sort of uh, becoming less prevalent. We have to look at the number of ventilators we have because we hardly ventilate, uh, but we're looking at the numbers and trying to predict what will happen to us was one of the challenges. So these are all the, and a lot of our people were looking at us, what we are gonna do, what we're gonna do. Even we were called in several times to have to start on when to start admitting patient or where we're gonna contain any positive case near the airport when they arrive, because we have a, a district uh, health center or a hospital uh, designed and built close to the international airport, thinking along these lines, whether we contain them there and move everything there. We even start designing borders where to close. Because we feel this is the most effective uh, strategy we can, we can sort of uh, execute effectively. We cannot rely on curating or testing or whatever until we receive the test. There's a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, issues we looked at. We even had to review our oxygen uh, plant machines, looking at our boilers because we hardly look in those things to maintain. These are the basics to sure. promote. And the expectations from the public are very high because they've been traveling overseas. They've been looking and uh, the world has been well informed of all the latest technology and that. So uh, that, this is the challenge now for us. Sure. We try and go back to our basics to hold on this. And uh, I think we consider ourselves blessed that we still haven't had a clinical case to manage, which everybody was scared uh, that once we have that, then uh, it might just spread like fire. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Nasseri, for the points. Uh, I'll uh, move on to Mr. Um, uh, Baker. 
this is a really critical question. One of the, one of the distinctions I'd make is between um, clinical services and public health or population health infrastructure. They are different. I mean, as I commented earlier, um, we underinvest in prevention because we don't always see the need for it, particularly between pandemics. And also because um, when you prevent illness, it's not always visible. And people talk about the curse of prevention because we, we always underinvest in it. So I would say um, one of the lessons from the pandemic is we need to put prevention and preparedness right at the center of our health systems. Another key lesson I think is that the Asia Pacific region basically developed its own response. It was very different from uh, the Western European model. In the past, we've looked to those institutions like CDC in the US, Public Health England, European Centers for Disease Control, um, to say, how do we manage things? And they've got big critical mass of staff. They got it completely wrong. Um, I think they, um, uh, as, as someone said, they displayed complacent exceptionalism I think countries in this region look far more to Asian models of, of um, how to respond. And I think they've proven to be far more effective. And the big lesson for me is that particularly in that period when you get a new emerging dangerous pandemic, you don't have vaccines, you, don't, you have limited supplies of a lot of key things, but very traditional public health and social measures, if used very strategically, worked extremely well. And so I think we could be a lot more self-reliant in this region. And I think the model of the SPC is a very good one of countries working together. We've all got limited resources, but actually having a, a much higher level of collaboration in terms of risk assessment, risk management, infrastructure, training, surveillance, all of these things. So I think um, a more regional approach along those lines, I think could be very valuable. Um, of course, we are waiting for the WHO to reform it may be a very long wait, so I, I wonder if we should look more to our successes in this region and build on them. Thanks. Uh, thank you, thank you. Since we have a time constraint here, I'll pass it on to Mr. Colin Beck. Uh, Mr., uh, you have uh, two minutes to uh, say a few words on this. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, um, I think the investment currently we, we, are, we are, uh, are placing on health is really also for a post-COVID um, uh, period in terms of uh, using the same machine to test TBs and other, other uh, equipment. But I think for many, nearly all the Pacific Island countries, most of us, um, all uh, the biggest chunk of our budget, national budget, is health. It's two, it's health and education. And um, so whenever we talk about health, it's basically from the public Purse. And uh, I think it's, 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 it's in that context that uh, um, when we uh, look at the, the issue, um, I just want to just uh, say that um, um, when we look at the, for Solomon Islands, even for preparing for a uh, possible community transmission, we already have something like a uh, community hospital in place. Um, but we, like I said, when we did the uh, uh, lockdown uh, uh, just to test our system, we found that uh, we won't be able to cope uh, if that. And so I think uh, trying to ensure that uh, we do not come to that uh, is something that we do. But um, whatever we do, the first places we, are, we, we have invested a lot is where the borders are located, uh, where um, um, our, we have a number of, uh, we have two international ports. We have uh, also shared borders with uh, uh, some of our close neighbors. So that's where we, we are paying a lot of our attention to at the moment in terms of investing a lot of our, um, uh, on, on that. But the issue is all those health infrastructure that has not received attention, we have given attention. It's just because we need to, it's basically our front line uh, of defense. Thank you very much, moderator. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move on to um, Dr. Vivili. Um, you have the floor. Two minutes, please. Thank you very much. I, I think it's important to, uh, to uh, recognize the context of the region. Other than uh, Solomon Islands, Fiji, and Papua New Guinea, who have a population of 500,000, a billion, and 9 million, uh, respectively. The, all, the rest of the 19 countries and territories have populations of between just over 1,000 and around 200,000. And so this notion 
that you can build up your capacity to a satisfactory level needs to be taken in that context. In that context. Mm -hmm. So looking at it from a regional perspective, yeah. the SPC approach is that we look at capacity building in three phases. Capacity building for those that can do it themselves, by and large the bigger countries. Capacity supplementation for those that can do some, can't do others. And then capacity substitution for the smaller countries. And so I guess my point is it, it's, it's easy to ask the question on, on how, what the challenges are in terms of infrastructure and human resources. But really the context determines how you want to address this uh, going forward. Um, it's a very good point, uh, Doctor. I'll move on to uh, Mr. Bruce. Do you have any points to say? Well, I'd just pick up on that. No, I think that was a, a really good point. Is that uh, um, uh, on on many issues such as health and security, uh, we need to take a regional view, and uh, and we're all neighbours, you know. And what impacts on one neighbour uh, impacts on the other neighbour, and so uh, we we can't be isolated. Uh, isolationists, we've we've got to uh, we've got to consider um, uh, health and security, and indeed uh, the economy as an important part of that as well. And so I, I'm hugely encouraged because uh, I, I think we need leadership in this area. I'm hugely encouraged because of of events like this, the uh, this forum, and and other events that I've attended recently. And and I say once again that I'm. I'm seeing and welcoming that health uh, has been elevated um, in in, uh, in its uh, consideration, and not only consideration, but its action by governments in the region uh, as as uh, how they are going to help uh, themselves and uh, indeed the region come out of this post-pandemic period. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, I would like to actually have you very just very very brief reaction to um, uh, the proposal of uh, Madame Foreign Minister uh, Mrs. Uh, Marsudi on the pandemic treaty that is meant to prevent and also ensure that nothing of such kind will be repeated again uh, in, in the future. Um, could you just uh, react it very quickly? Less than one minute, please, uh, Dr. Nasseri. Look, I'm not hearing the clear. Can you repeat the question? I would just uh, like to hear a very quick reaction to the, to the proposal by Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia at the opening remarks made today that she wants to propose a new pandemic treaty which aims to prevent, uh, you know, um, the in the future, or also ensure that in the future, you know, when um, this kind of pandemic uh, takes place, countries will be able to actually work together in a much uh, coordinated uh, and orderly way to make sure that it doesn't affect uh, countries, particularly those vulnerable ones or countries that actually have no, in no position to uh, defend themselves from this onslaught. So uh, could you um, give a quick reaction to the pandemic treaty? Well, uh, our own country has signed to several treaties, which at times we feel uh, we're just signatories, but we really don't know the benefit. Uh, for this kind of pandemic treaty, it depends also on what the pandemic, what causes the pandemic. You know, whether it's, whether it's uh, goes fast, like what's now it has involved nearly all the countries in the world, or it's just on one zone of the globe. So sure. we need more details on that. Sure, sure. So thank, thanks a lot. Uh, I'll move on to uh, uh, Dr. Baker. Thanks. Professor Look, Baker. Sure, yeah. thank you. I think this is a great challenge. And of course, it depends very much what the, what's in the treaty and how well resourced it is. And like a number of you, I, I did a lot of work on the International Health Regulations 2005, getting them, developing them, getting them implemented. And, and that was very aspirational and really one of the most remarkable bits of international health law that every WHO member country signed on to. And what, it, what is in there is a wonderful international agreement. It's got two problems. 
and I think it's very illustrative for the problem we have now. One is that um, it's reactive, so it's about identifying outbreaks that after they've happened and trying to coordinate a response. And we saw that it didn't help hugely in the current um, pandemic. Declaring it a public health of emergency of international concern was not enough. Uh, and we need something that is more, re more proactive to actually prevent outbreaks at an earlier stage. And also I think uh, that has a lot more resources coming with it and probably stronger international powers. Um, so the, the new nor the international norm established by the treaty has got to be at a much higher level than what the IHR said. I mean, it was a good start, but it, we can see when it really, as they say, you know, the first casualty of any war plan is when it when the actual in the first battle, and it basically has failed us. So I think we have to do better. And so I think we've got a benchmark that was good at it in terms of its intent. But, but leapfrogging from that to say, what do we need? And I think all of us, we've had such a vivid example of what we need, the kind of international law and agreements we need. Uh, so sure. I think we know what this looks like. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Colin Beck. Thank you very much. Pandemics are basically global issues. It needs global solution. So um, like I said, uh, multilateralism is important for us. Um, um, having a treaty that will ensure that uh, it triggers immediate um, place uh, mechanisms to respond to, to, to issues. I, I think that will probably be um, useful for us. Um, we certainly would like to uh, support such, such a, such a, um, a, a proposal. Um, um, it's needed like plastic pollution. We don't have a treaty, so people just keep throwing plastics. Um, I think the world works well work well in a crisis and i think this is a crisis if we see it as a crisis let's work together and get something in a framework that uh, probably what uh, the minister was referring to so we cer certainly would like to support uh, such a proposal thank you thank you I move to you mr vivili um, one minute please I think if we look at the framework convention to bio control for instance it's it's a good example of uh, a Convention slash treaty that has got some countries to, to move on, on some of the issues. But again, the notion of people signing up to it, I mean, if we had a treaty on this, for example, would it prevent the vaccine hesitancy? Of course not, because at the end of the day, the national priorities still is national priority. But most certainly there are opportunities if we look at, at the treaty in getting a commitment from people to help others uh, to build up their systems to be better responsive uh, in case a pandemic comes. Thank you. Thank you very much for a good point. Uh, Ms. Mr. Armstrong? Yeah, look, I would agree. If we can, if we can get uh, countries to commit to uh, support um, uh, others in their need, that, then of course that's a good thing. Um, but, but it will, uh, these whole things, and, and when there is a uh, catastrophe, needs a strong leadership. And that starts with uh, organisations like the World Health Organisation um, and, uh, and then going down through uh, regions, countries, and uh, and then into the health systems. Strong leadership to uh, not only help uh, their own people, but take a broader view on the importance of uh, stability in our in our regions. And once again, I come back to uh, supporting our neighbours. Uh, very very. Uh, uh, so if something like that helped to support our neighbours, of course it's a great thing. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, I uh, appreciate very much uh, your contribution to this discussion. I mean, you've been um, very um, fruitful uh, and also um, enriching our uh, discussion, particularly in addressing not only the health, uh, infra the health uh, system in, in our region, but also, um, you know, ad addressing specifically the issue of uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, I understand that uh, one uh, key um, factor to resolve this issue is communication, as you all have emphasized, apart from other supporting mechanisms and infrastructure that uh, are also very important. And, and the other underlying uh, key um, uh, element of this is uh, the strong leadership and political, uh, political decision and strong political decision by, by the leaders uh, to make sure that uh, the region, the countries are well protected at the same time, we also continue to have developments in other sectors, um, a focus on national development policy as well as 
uh, the issue of uh, the impact of the, the, the pandemic and the, the health in general. And also, um, of course, um, with uh, uh, assistance from uh, uh, regional partners and also international bodies uh, are very critical to make sure that uh, we can um, ultrapass this situation uh, better and also help preventing anything from happening or worsening uh, in the future. So uh, thank you very much for all your contribution. I'm sure there are still lots of questions, but uh, uh, you know these are challenges that we all will uh, uh, pick up together and uh, work together to make sure that uh, it can be handled uh, in the future for the good of our countries and also for the good of our people. So thank you very much. I would like to hand uh, over to the Master of Ceremony uh, in Wellington. Thank you, His Excellency Dionisio Babo Suarez, and thank you to all of the participants for taking the time to take part on this forum. I am sure we can all take into account of what we have been discussed today by our prominent speaker and panelists. Before closing, please be sure to visit for more than 200 booths in our virtual trade exhibitions. And don't forget to join tomorrow's forum, which is the Tourism and Fisheries on the 29th October 2021. Thanks again for joining us today and we'll see you next time. The first Pacific Exposition has created a Pacific momentum. It's been regarded as the most comprehensive expo in the region. Attended by dignitaries, business figures, and visitors from 19 Pacific countries and territories, symbolizes togetherness and brotherhood. Promoted investment in tourism in Pacific countries with business deals of 104 million New Zealand dollars. In 2021, we welcome you to the second Pacific Exposition virtual exhibition. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, we aim to project optimism by connecting governments, businesses, and key stakeholders to discuss common issues with the Pacific people at the heart of the discussions. As part of a shared commitment to recover together and recover stronger. This exposition will cover current topics the Pacific Talks will see prominent figures sharing their insights on regional priorities. As we're stepping towards economic recovery, find out what policies lie ahead in the Trade, Investment and Creative Economy Forum. Hear the efforts to strengthen health infrastructures in the Pacific in the Health Forum.